Carl Jung is quoted as saying, The cinema, like the detective story, makes it possible to experience without danger all the excitement, passion and desirousness which must be repressed in a humanitarian ordering of life. Since its inception in the late 19th century, cinema has become one of the most popular and inspiring forms of entertainment, art, education and propaganda. The birth of cinema is one of many interconnecting events and inventions around the world, born out of an array of new technology revolving around machinery, photography, optical illusion and a human love to be entertained and inspired. of cinema is that no one country can claim its paternity and it is a worldwide endeavour encompassing many different people from around the globe. It was in 1824 in England that Peter Mark Roger first came up with an explanation for how moving images create the illusion of motion. Although later proven to be incorrect, this principle is known as the persistence of vision. This simply defined is when a series of pictures or frames are played or presented at a rate fast enough to trick the human mind into thinking it is viewing a moving image. The effect of the persistence of vision, the writer David Parkinson notes, was defined in 1824 by Peter Mark Roger as the ability of the retina to retain an image of an object from one twentieth to one fifth of a second after its removal from the field of vision. However, it has since been shown that film seems to move because the brain, and not the eye, is accepting stimuli that it is incapable of perceiving as separate. The brain has a perception threshold below which images exposed to it will appear as continuous and film's speed of 24 frames per second is below that threshold, thus making cinema itself a strange art form for it is primarily an illusion. It is a mystery as to when it was first noticed that playing images next to each other and viewing them in quick succession created the illusion of a moving image. Around AD 180, the Chinese inventor, Ting Wan, of which no known picture exists, is credited with inventing a device to utilise this effect for entertainment. This invention is called the zoetrope. A zoetrope is basically a cylinder with various slits in it a sequence of pictures that are linked to each other are drawn or placed inside the cylinder and through the slits you can view inside the illusion of motion when the cylinder is spun. This principle laid the groundwork for later developments in using photographic images to create motion images or to give it its technical term, cinematography. Motion images are one part of the founding principles of cinema, but key to its development was the projection of images in shapes. The origins of light projected images date back to the puppets of China, India and Java. It was not until around the 17th century that light projected imagery would start to become popular in Europe and North America, and it was a magic lantern that captivated people's attention. The magic lantern was used as a form of entertainment starting as early as the 15th century and its first incarnation may even date back as far as the time of King Solomon. Its precise origins are a mystery and no original inventor is known of. The magic lantern itself is simply a lantern which its light source, usually created by a wick or candle, is used to project a single slide or shape onto a wall or flat surface. The magic lantern relates directly to the modern day slide projector and only contributed in part to the development of cinema, albeit an important one. 
Various enhancements of this technology included using a magic lantern to project motion images from a zoetrope, thus building the groundwork for cinematic film projection. It was developments in light-projected entertainment technology that were to be used in the newly developing science of photography to establish what we know as cinematography. The history of photography is also one of complex inventions and discoveries around the world. The very first developments in photography and optics originated thousands of years ago. Aristotle wrote and developed ideas of how human vision works and studied rays of light. He used a pinhole camera, or camera obscura, so he could study light rays. Aristotle was one of the first people known to study light using a camera obscura, although its invention has not been accredited to one single person and its original development remains a mystery. The camera obscura is basically a box with a small pinhole that arouses a thin ray of light into the box. This ray of light can be viewed as an image if the camera obscura is adapted to pick up the reflection using a mirror or shiny surface. Ibn al-Hathim, who lived 965 AD to 1040 AD, an Arab scholar who was born in Iraq, further developed the camera obscura and noted that a single ray of light that passed through the hole also carried the image reflected from wherever the light was coming from, and in this sense, that light carries information. This seemingly simple discovery was a revolutionary one in the development in the history of how vision works, and it is a principle that paved the way for the capturing of photographic images for use in the pinhole camera. Initially, the camera obscura was used as a sketching aid by artists, and it wasn't until around the 1820s and the development of chemical photography that fixing the image became a reality, and photography took its first steps into the recognisable form that it is today. As far back as the 13th century, it was known that some chemicals darkened or changed colour when exposed to light. Albertus Magnus, in the 13th century, was one of the first people to note that silver nitrate darkened when exposed to light. In the 17th century, Robert Boyle reported silver chloride turned black after exposure to air, although this was in fact sunlight. In 1727, Johann Henrik Schultz discovered that certain liquids could be prepared that would change colour when exposed to light. At the end of the 18th century and the beginning of the 19th century, Thomas Wedgwood conducted experiments where he captured silhouettes of objects using paper covered with silver nitrate, thus making him one of the first ever pioneers of photography. It was not until the work of two French inventors and scientists that fixing a still image using chemical means became a reality. They were Nisiphor Niepce and Louis Daguerre. Working in conjunction, they developed a process to produce fixed images. Unfortunately, Nisiphor Niepce died before the work was completed. But by 1839, Daguerre had perfected the process and it was announced at the French Academy of Sciences. This process was called daguerreotype and produced some of the very first photographic images. This image, taken in 1838 or early 1839, was one of the first photos taken using the daguerreotype process. Its exposure time was about 10 minutes, meaning a man standing still having his shoes cleaned was the only person captured in the photo. Daguerreotype images were produced directly onto a mirror polished silver plate bearing a coating of silver halide particles deposited by iodine vapour. But the images that were produced were very delicate and could be destroyed by even the slightest handling. In the year of 1839, an English inventor called William Fox Talbot had been working on his own type of chemical photographic process. This process, called the calotype process, was to greatly advance the practical application of photography. 
The calotype process created the method of negative positive photographic images, and this is a precursor to most photography processes of the 19th, 20th and 21st centuries, making William Talbot a very important figure in the history of photography and cinema. The calotype process also allowed for photos to be developed on paper, thus allowing photography to be open to the masses, and the same photo could be produced again and again using the negative image. In 1849 in France, Joseph Plateau was one of the first to suggest using a device called the Phenakistoscope to project photos. This device developed in 1839 was similar to the zoetrope but more advanced. Later, in 1877, a device called the Praxinoscope was created by Charles Emile Reynard. This was another technological advancement from the zoetrope, and in 1889, he created the Theatre Optique using the Praxinoscope, not only to retire images, but also using an adapted magic lantern, he projected these images onto a screen. But the static photos used at the time in such devices proved to be little better than pictures and a way of recording action simultaneously as it occurred was needed. Two great innovators were to work in this field and develop the process of series photography, allowing the capturing of multiple images in chronological order. They were Etienne Jules Marie and Edward Mybridge. Edward Mybridge is most famous for his sequence of photos of a horse race, proving that a horse does lift all hooves off the ground when it gallops. This work was commissioned for a bet by the Governor of California, Leland Stanford. Mybridge proved the Governor correct in 1879 by using film that had fast exposure time and a lineup of 12 cameras all taking single shots in quick succession following the motion of the horse. Mybridge then went on to develop the zoopraxiscope, which cast onto a screen the drawings made of his photographs. Although this was not projection, it was a big step towards it. In 1882, Etienne Jules Marie adapted a device called the photographic revolver to take a series of photos. At first, a revolving plate was used to record a dozen instantaneous images in the course of one second. After various experimentations and adaptations, Marie eventually turned to celluloid film developed by the East Kodak Company to produce continuous strips of images. Marie went on to produce numerous photo sequences and although he did try, he was not able to develop a projection device for moving photographic images. It was a French inventor by the name of Louis Le Prince who is recognised to have recorded the first ever motion captured sequences in 1888. The first short sequences of moving images ever filmed were the round hay garden scene and the Leeds bridge scene. These filmed scenes are recognised as the first ever motion capture cinematography sequences. However, it will forever remain a mystery as to the success Le Prince may have gone on to achieve and what happened to him in 1890. For in 1890, after seeing his brother, he boarded a train in Dijon that was heading for Paris, where he would meet with friends and then go on to America, where he was planning to patent his single lens camera. But he never made it to Paris, and his luggage, including his camera, was never found. After extensive searches by the French police, Scotland Yard and Le Prince's family, not a solid clue to his disappearance was ever discovered. There remains till this day a large amount of speculation about Le Prince's disappearance. It is unlikely we will ever know what happened to Le Prince, but above all else, he should be remembered for the contribution he made towards cinema. At about the same time, Thomas Elva Edison was also developing motion capture cinematography. Edison was to fund his head engineer, William Kennedy Lurie Dixon, in the development of a photo sequence capture camera. Dixon 
developing and adapting elements from all other motion capturing devices and knowledge, developed a film camera called the Kinetograph in 1890. A year later, he developed the Kinetoscope, a large device to view the motion captured images. Edison also set up the first ever movie studio in the early 1890s, where various but limited footage was shot, including the Rice Irwin Kiss and the Fred Ott Sneeze. These short movies were limited to the technology at the time, with most being unedited lengths of celluloid, no longer than the strips of celluloid themselves. The kinetoscope was not a projection device though, and Edison unwisely disregarded the possibilities of projection and concentrated on peep shows, thinking they would be just another whim in a novelty hungry age. During the same period, two French brothers were working on their own film capturing and projection device. This device, the cinematograph, was to bring about the dawn of modern cinema and it was the Lumiere brothers who were the inventors. It was in 1895, on the 28th of December, that one of the most famous film screenings in film history took place. It was held at the Grand Café in Paris, and customers paid one franc for the screening of 10 short Lumiere films. The screening lasted for about 25 minutes. The films included, amongst others, workers leaving the Lumiere factory and Cordelier Square in Lyon. What the Lumiere brothers had achieved using the combination and development of previous technology was a workable way of combining the kinetoscope or viewing device with the magic lantern, thus projecting a sequence of photos to create the illusion of a moving image, or as it is also known, cinematography. It must be mentioned that the Lumiere brothers had done screenings before using their projection device, but this is a date that has gone down in history and is one of the first screenings to charge an entrance fee, one of the foundations of modern cinema. The Lumieres also should be celebrated for they stand high in the rank of film innovators in history. Along with the assistance of the inventor, Jules Carpentier, at their photographic firm, they invented the cinematograph, a three-in-one device that could film, print and project images. It was hand-crankable, portable and soon after its invention it was being used around the world. Interestingly, the Lumiere brothers believed that the cinema or film projection would be a short-lived form of entertainment and audiences would soon become bored of the novelty and not wish to pay for motion images that they could see with their own eyes for free. Louis Lumiere is famously quoted as saying, the cinema is an invention without a future. The audiences had other ideas and loved the new form of entertainment, constantly creating a demand for cinema. As technology of cinematography advanced, so could the creative output using the new medium. One of the forebearers to take advantage and develop the creative aspects of cinematography was George Malaise. He is considered by some to be the father of the narrative film, and whom D.W. Griffith is quoted as saying, I owe him everything. Millers made over 500 films from 1896 to 1906. He was one of the first people to introduce cutting and chronological editing as we see in the movies today. It was also at this time that public demand for the movies was increasingly and unexpectedly growing. Around the same time that Millers was making his first short films, Edwin S. Porter, in 1903, working for Edison, made The Life of an American Fireman, which displayed new visual storytelling techniques and incorporated stock footage with Porter's own photography. It acted as a major precursor to Porter's most famous film, The Great Train Robbery, also made in 1903. This had a running time of 12 minutes and is considered a milestone in narrative filmmaking and one of the first films to tell a story, albeit a simple one. 
The first ever device developed to record sound before the phonograph was called the phonautograph. This was invented in 1857 by Eduardo Leon Scott in France. This device transcribed sound waves onto a visual medium. The first medium of which was a lamped blackened glass plate. But this device had no means of playing the recordings back. A fascinating insight into this period of sound recording was that it was not realised at the time that the waveform transcribed by the phonautograph was a recording of the sound wave that only needed a playback mechanism to replicate the sound. In 1895, Thomas Edison introduced the kinetophone, which marks the first time sound was added to cinematography. The kinetophone was not a projection device and sound was added using a device called a cylinder phonograph that was added to the kinetoscope to produce the kinetophone. It was in 1899 that a sound system called Cinemacrophonograph, or Phonorama, was exhibited in Paris. This device required headphones to hear the sound, which was similar to the kinetophone. It was not until Clement Maurice and Henri Loret in France developed the Phono Cinema Theatre that allowed the projection of sound in theatres. This system was first exhibited at the Paris Exposition in 1900 and is considered the first public projection of both recorded sound and motion image. Meanwhile, silent film production was starting to gain pace around the world and what is considered the first feature-length film was made in 1906 by Charles Tate in Australia. It was called The Ned Kelly Gang. At 70 minutes long, it had an unprecedented running time and only made on a budget of around $2,250, although the complete film has since been lost, with only around 12 minutes running time left in existence. As film technology advanced, so did the creative and storytelling possibilities. It was in the first part of the 20th century that one of the first famous film directors came to prominence. His name was D.W. Griffith, and he is considered one of the fathers of modern cinema. It was in 1908 that a young D.W. Griffith made his first movie, The Adventures of Dolly. Still in the period of silent film production, its narrative structure and editing were to set the way for Griffith's coming skill with filmmaking. He was to develop filmic techniques and codes that brought in-depth narrative storytelling to cinema. He directed around 450 films and was one of the most successful directors of his time. One of his most notable films, Birth of a Nation, made in 1915 and based on Thomas Dixon's American Civil War movies, was racist and showed a lack of integrity in portraying African Americans. He would respond to criticism about this film by making Intolerance, shot in 1916. This movie used some of the biggest film sets and crew sizes ever at that time. The story portrayed 2,500 years of history and showed how truth and justice are threatened by hypocrisy and injustice. Although audience reaction was muted at best, Griffith's career faulted after 1916 and in 19... 31, when a film he made called The Struggle was a failure, he would endure a 17-year exile from Hollywood, never to return to his once high status. Griffith certainly was not the only person developing filmic codes and narratives, and his work was in part continuing on from others, such as George Millais and Edwin S. Porter. Whatever you may think about Griffith... His work showed cinema technology had entered a truly advanced form of storytelling and narrative construction. In Russia, at the beginning of the 20th century, not long after D.W. Griffith was setting forth his place in cinematic history, the Russian director Sergei Eisenstein was developing his own distinct form of cinema. In the 1920s, Russian montage, as it is known, came to be a prominent filmmaking style in Russia. The basic concept of montage relies heavily upon editing and creating meaning through the collaboration of shots in a sequence and not from a storyline. For example, the three shots that are shown here are taken from Eisenstein's Battleship Potemkin. 
They are played in sequence to signify the meaning of Soviet Russia rising up against the oppression of the Tsar. The term montage literally means putting together. And for an oversimplified example, if you place a shot of an ear, then the shot of a door next to each other, the meaning would be eavesdrop. This is montage in a nutshell. In 1925, Eisenstein made one of his most famous films, Battleship Potemkin, a revolutionary portrait of mutiny aboard a Russian battleship not long before the Russian Revolution. Although praised by critics, Russian audiences were indifferent to it and much preferred entertaining and emotionally engaging Hollywood-style continuity films. Importantly, Montage offered another approach to filmmaking other than a continuity-based style, and it also showed how far the technology of cinema had come in little more than 25 years. The progress of sound recording and playback for cinema had been steadily advancing, although applying synchronised pre-recorded sound to film had encountered many problems, such as recording fidelity, synchronising sound to film, and projecting sound at a satisfactory level. These problems were to be overcome by the advance of technology and innovation. In 1919, an American inventor called Lee D. Forrest developed one of the first sound on film technologies for commercial application. In Forrest's system, which he called phonofilm, sound was photographically recorded onto one side of a strip of film to create what was called a composite where simply two elements have been composited together. If the sound was synchronised exactly to the film, the playback would be perfect. Another system developed and used in the first part of the 20th century was called the Vitaphone. The Vitaphone was a disc-based system produced by General Electric and purchased by Warner Brothers. The Vitaphone did not print sound to film, but onto 16-inch phonograph records. These records were then played using Vitaphone systems at theatres where the film they were produced for was playing. There were many problems with the Vitaphone system, including synchronisation with the film being projected and the phonograph records, which could not be edited and limited the creative output for films using the Vitaphone system. Taking into account numerous technological improvements, it would be sound on film that would eventually become the universal standard for synchronised sound in cinema. It was in 1927 that one of the first movies ever produced to contain synchronised dialogue sequences was released to the movie-going public. This film was The Jazz Singer and it used the Vitaphone system. There have been other films that had used synchronised sound and music, such as Don Juan, released in 1926, that had a musical score played by the New York Philharmonic. The Jazz Singer was the first to have dialogue which accounted for about 25% of the soundtrack in the movie. The movie heralded the coming of the so-called talkies and signalled the start of the end for silent films where talkies were ultimately more popular and technologically advanced. The movie itself is based on a stage play by Samson Raphaelson. It has a culturally complex storyline with a young Jewish man trying to make it as a jazz singer against the wishes of his father. It was a signifier of the times that so-called blackface makeup was used by Al Jolson who plays the lead role. This was naively racist at best and was used to take on the appearance of an archetype of African Americans although there is the assimilation of African Americans and Jews experiencing similar identities as outsiders, and this is something that is put across in the film. At this point, cinema had come a long way, bringing together motion image and sound, with many brilliant innovations, inventions, passion and commitment, creating one of the most unique and inspiring art forms and entertainment that has ever been produced in the history of the world, establishing itself as a powerful element in modern societies.